Hello, newborn desert tortoise. Welcome to your world. Look around. Break out of your shell and explore what lies ahead. Stretch your legs. Feel the desert soil. One thing for sure though, it won't be easy. This is a male? Yeah. Oh yeah, look at that tail. Yeah. It appears that the desert tortoise is, is in trouble. At, uh, I think, eight or nine study sites, we saw declines from 30 to 50 percent. The tortoise started having severe population declines in about 1989. Very few of the small tortoises survive. There's about a 95 percent mortality rate within the first five years. We're seeing declining populations due to a, a variety of factors, not not just disease, not just predation, not just habitat loss, but I think a mix of all those things are really causing some declines that I hope we can reverse. Desert tortoises have lived across the southwest landscape for thousands of years. Their adaptation to its extreme harsh environment is amazing. Surviving ground temperatures greater than 130 degrees Fahrenheit and able to live a year or even two without water. But now, the desert tortoise is in danger of extinction. In the 1920s, there were hundreds of desert tortoises per square mile in parts of the Mojave Desert. Now, in those same areas, there may be fewer than a dozen per square mile. Tortoise extinction would have a ripple effect across the desert. As tortoise numbers drop, so too do the numbers of underground burrows that they dig. A wide host of animals depend upon these burrows for shelter from extreme summer heat and the cold of winter. Even in a protected critical habitat area like the Red Cliffs Desert Reserve in southern Utah, the tortoise population dropped nearly 50 percent since 2000. But perhaps science can yet turn the tide. Science can give us a lot of information on how best to manage populations and areas in which the tortoises live. I work with the, the Desert Tortoise Recovery Office. Our job is to facilitate recovery efforts for the species. There's four states, three Fish and Wildlife Service regions, countless agencies and stakeholders and interest groups and researchers. Much of the research guiding the recovery effort is being carried out by ecologists and biologists with the Department of the Interior, U.S. Geological Survey. USGS researchers are conducting a really great variety of research, including tortoise physiology, uh, general ecology, the responses to fires, disease and health, hibernation, reproduction, all aspects of their ecology. What works, what doesn't work, the more we can learn about the tortoise, the better chance we have of bringing it back. Because the Mojave Desert Tortoise is listed under the Endangered Species Act, there is a federal mandate to restore the populations. The tortoise is among the top recipients of federal dollars because their decline has been quite sudden and wide-ranging. And because they are so long-lived, it takes years to know which recovery efforts are working or not. The Mojave Desert covers some 25,000 square miles. It is a part of Utah, Arizona, Nevada, and California. Over 30 years ago, USGS researcher Christine Berry set up 27 study plots in the Mojave and adjoining Colorado deserts. These plots were designed to help understand how tortoise populations and their habitats might be changing over time. Three, four, five, six, seven, the long-term study plots provide a substantial amount of data on the status and trends in tortoise populations. They're places one can return to year after year, decade after decade, and find out how the tortoise populations are doing. 
I selected for long-term study 15 of the plots that had an adequate sample size of at least 20 to 30 tortoises uh, per square mile. These plots have all experienced declines in tortoise numbers and have helped identify some of the causes behind that decline. 18, 19, in this particular plot near Needles, California, the scientists are counting the numbers of the invasive plant Saharan mustard. It is one of several invading plant species causing widespread change to southwest deserts. There were 6,000 in this group on the same transect where there was a handful in 1999. The proportion of plants that we have now, 10 years later, is just enormous. It's been major change. Exact impacts of this invasion are being assessed. The invaders take up precious water and nutrients. If the trend continues, there's likely to be a profound effect on native creatures such as the desert tortoise. Invasive plants pose other dramatic threats as well. So one of the threats facing desert tortoises today is increased wildfires because of the invasion of exotic grasses and things which uh, perpetuate a fire cycle that is not historically present in the Mojave Desert. The dry stems of spreading invasive grasses fuel devastating backcountry fires. Tens of thousands of acres of critical tortoise habitat have burned in one year. Native plant foods disappear. Shrub and shade covers are eliminated. Some tortoises have been burned to death. And it looks like this is going to be a recurring risk for a long time, at least until we figure out how to deal with the invasive grasses. The Desert Tortoise Conservation Center was originally established as a way station for tortoises displaced by Las Vegas development. Today, with the expertise of management by the San Diego Zoo and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it will fill a key role by providing a base for applied research, training, and community support. One of the USGS studies underway at the center involves a promising head starting program. Head starting is taking place at several locations across the Mojave. It's a technique where captive tortoises lay eggs in pens, with the young being raised and later released, that so that researchers can better learn about their survival. Since females lay the eggs deep in burrows, how do scientists know when the eggs are laid, so they can get the eggs to incubate them? 14727. So we're in the process now of every two weeks, we x-ray the female tortoises. Put the tortoise on the plate. And I'm gonna shoot the x-ray now. Okay, stay back, done. Okay. This is one of the x-ray images that we just shot about five minutes ago. And this is tortoise 14998. And you can see five uh, visible shelled eggs within the x-ray here and subsequently if they lay eggs based on the weight change we know that at least the six eggs that we x-rayed last week have been deposited somewhere inside the uh, enclosures. We will go and find the nest and collect the eggs and then put them in incubators to uh, hatch hatchlings. You guys, I found an egg! Got one? All oh. right! Once the eggs laid in the ground, the temperature in which the eggs are incubated on will determine the sex of the, the hatchling. Warmer temperatures are going to produce females, cooler temperatures are going to produce males. Once the eggs hatch in the incubators, one of the first things we're going to do is remove them from the incubator, put them in some sort of outdoor enclosure, um, allowing them to get the natural sunlight and hopefully the natural vegetation that they would normally be eating and then uh, just monitor these animals and try to ensure survival as best we can. For the desert tortoise to be taken off the endangered species list, populations must increase or remain stable for 25 years. Hey, baby tortoise, you're beginning an amazing life. The desert tortoise is the largest reptile in the Mojave Desert. 
Their lifespan is a bit like humans. Young are soft-shelled and vulnerable. Sexual maturity arrives around age 15. Males and females court. And the female digs a nest for the four to eight eggs, each about the size of a ping pong ball. The shell, called a carapace, has two layers, bone underneath, and on top, scoots made of keratin, like fingernails. Desert tortoises spend 90% of their time in underground burrows, which can be shallow or as long as 30 feet. There they hibernate in winter and stay cool in summer, when the burrow temperature may be 40 degrees cooler than the searing heat above. Desert tortoises can live to be over 50 years old. We're tapping him out with the hopes that uh, when he hears noise, he's gonna come charging out of the burrow. Right on cue. You ready? While deaths from upper respiratory tract disease triggered the endangered species listing, additional threats are multiplying. Ravens have become an increasingly deadly predator of young tortoises. The easiest place to find raven nests is underneath power towers. Yeah, they're back for a visit. Sticks blown off the nest. Oh. Here's a tortoise that's been eaten by a raven. It's characteristic that they'll peck a hole in the top uh, to kill it. In northern forests such as Maine, ravens are still a wilderness bird. In the Mojave Desert, which has had uh, urban sprawl and, and uh, so many human modifications, uh, ravens are, have increased <clears throat> up to a thousand percent in the last 50 years. And the availability of food uh, has just caused this huge population increase. They're social birds and they congregate around landfills, around sewage ponds, around fast food restaurants, cattle yards, horse properties, anywhere where there's easy food. But the ones that have learned to uh, uh, eat juvenile tortoises, they can decimate a generation of tortoises right around the nest. So those ravens are targeted. And if they find evidence of a tortoise predation under a raven nest, then the Bureau of Land Management calls the Wildlife Services Department of the USDA and, and they come out and kill the raven. The power company comes out and knocks down the nest. They're just so adaptable. And then they teach the young uh, that tortoise is uh, good eating so the next generation becomes a tortoise predator, too. Desert tortoise recovery is enormously complicated because there is so much that scientists need to learn. For instance, just with the exotic non-native plants, what happens to tortoises who eat them? Or, if spraying herbicides is used to control the invasive plants and the tortoises eat them, what then? Well, we're studying the nutritional ecology of tortoises um, in relation to the wildfires that happened in 2005, but the, the pens are so armored to help keep the predators from eating them. About 25 of them are actually progeny from adults that were removed from this property when the housing development started to go in. Um, so we x-rayed those adult females, collected the eggs, incubated the eggs, and then raised them at the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center throughout the last six months. Today we were taking our first blood sample. Um, we have plans to take blood samples three times a year from all the animals that went into this project. And with the blood, we're gonna study a variety of parameters, mostly parameters that would help us understand their meta metabolic fitness, that would again relate to some of the various treatments and their diet. 
the nutrition study is asking primarily do tortoises on a native diet perform better, grow better, survive better than tortoises on an exotic, unnatural diet. So much about the life of the reclusive tortoise is a mystery that scientists are beginning to solve with 21st century technology. For example, a customized GPS logging system collects more data over the vast desert landscape than ever would be possible with field crews. One of the things we've been kind of on the leading edge of for a long time is trying to get some, some technology to help um, do a difficult job. You know, just the act of putting a, a radio transmitter on a tortoise means that we've got to have people out there on a monthly or, or sometimes weekly basis uh, monitoring tortoise activity to get data on how they're using habitat and what kinds of body temperatures they're achieving. We've got a company to help us miniaturize GPSs and actually now we have GPS loggers that are actually as small as the radio transmitter we were using 10 years ago and now it has a radio transmitter and a GPS and a data logger all in the same package and so we're pretty happy about kind of being able to work with technology companies to get to get the kinds of things that you have in your cell phone uh, working for us on tortoises to help us understand how they're, how they're using habitat. The GPS logger can follow and monitor the tortoise all day, every day, and everywhere it moves. So if I want to know, for example, uh, are tortoises using burned habitat or not uh, after wildfire, and, and I only get one picture of each tortoise a day, it takes me a lot longer to achieve the information than if I get detailed information about every day, how much time is that animal spending in or out of burned areas. And so we're getting all this now with, with people watching tortoises, but I think in the future, uh, we can get a lot more detailed information and be able to put a better picture together of, of what they're doing. We've been watching tortoise populations for the desert tortoise for a little over 30 years in the desert, um, almost 40 years in some areas, and everything indicates to us that there's been a steady decline in populations over that time. And until recently, that was a big, it was kind of a, kind of a mystery. We knew that it was lots of influences, but only recently have we had the ability to get on the ground and collect massive amounts of information across the entire Mojave Desert, and then put it all into analyses that we can start to understand the pattern for the Mojave and we're starting to pin down pieces of that story about why are we having these declines. And then, did you say number two is the one without the transmitter? Over the last five years, we've been working with a team of, of scientists, um, including uh, biologists, but also ecologists, plant ecologists, people who do GIS remote sensing, hydrologists, geologists, and geographers to, to put together a desert tortoise habitat model. So looking at different elevations, different rock types, uh, different vegetation associations, uh, different precipitation and temperature regimes, uh, and how those all come together to influence what uh, we know as the current desert tourist distribution. Shades from yellow to orange, then red, show good to ideal tortoise habitat, while dark blue is not tortoise habitat. So here in the Mojave Preserve, we can see we have areas of, of high tortoise concentration and predicted high suitable habitat, and also areas like these blue ones where we predict that would be low suitable habitat. The model's ability to predict habitat type is proving to have wide applications across the Mojave and into the future. It's an invaluable tool for guiding the search for best locations to site new green energy projects. And the model can project us into the future, helping to clarify possible impacts of climate change. Model components such as rainfall totals and temperature can be adjusted to show how habitats will shift as the climate changes. The model helps scientists understand the desert tortoise on a range-wide scale over millions of acres. It has the potential to make a huge difference in desert tortoise recovery helping to ensure that critical habitats will be suitable into the future. There's no one thing killing off desert tortoises. A multitude of threats are interacting. Scientists must prioritize which are the most important and which problems can be solved. Hey, baby tortoise. 
the heat is on. Not only do you have all the struggles of life in the harsh desert and dwindling habitat, now there are new threats on the horizon. I think uh, in prehistory, pre-Western history of people moving out here, uh, this was a giant wilderness. It was a, a very hostile environment to humans. And uh, about just a little over 100 years ago, the, the West began to be opened up with um, new trails for immigrants. Those folks were, were sort of eking out a living uh, in the low desert areas. Then the highway system was put in that opened up the area so people were moving through and widespread availability of lots of electricity and air conditioning made it a less hostile place. And what this all leads to is going from an area that was just little islands of human habitat um, 80 years ago and 60 years ago to what is now becoming an area that is dominated by human influence with little tiny islands of open natural habitat left. And that's where we still find the tortoises is in these little islands that are left. Not only has development encroached into the desert, scientists have recently found a pattern that shows human impacts extending beyond where people are living. There's a shadow that's much larger than the actual footprint of buildings and roadways. It's created by predators, such as coyotes and ravens, that are subsidized by human food and waste. Living outside the edge of these areas, others have their eye on the desert too. There's a, a lot of sunshine in the uh, Mojave Desert, and there's a, a lot of open land that energy developers and people who are, are really interested in getting the country off of fossil fuels look at and say, wow, look at all that sun hitting the ground and we can put solar fields there. Well, that's where the desert tortoise lives and other sensitive species. I think it's important that you put these solar projects and the windmill projects over at the edge of the desert, the western edge or maybe the eastern edge or near major cities, but not in the middle. Then you're bringing an industrial park into the middle of tortoise habitat. So siting of the energy projects is crucial. The first priority being to put them on lands already disturbed or where there is no tortoise habitat. And the second being not to fragment large areas that are a uniform block of habitat. The challenge is finding the right balance to be able to achieve our alternative energy goals while not sacrificing the native landscape and, and the, our natural heritage at the same time. One definition of desert is a landscape that gets less than 10 inches of rainfall a year. When the desert gets a good year, maybe one in 10 years, we'll have a, a really good winter rainfall. And in those years, it's just unbelievably spectacular. In the Mojave and Sonoran deserts, there live nearly 150 species of mammals, including mountain lions, ground squirrels, and desert bighorn sheep, along with 70 species of amphibians and reptiles, and more than 300 species of flowering trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. Well, the, the desert grows on you, and it's uh... Fabulous in the spring. The spring bloom is, is the most dramatic change of uh, season uh, of any of the kind of ecosystems in the U.S. probably. From brown to green to color all within a month. This year was a above average year. It was great. We brought people out on a field trip from all over the world. Everywhere we went in the desert we found 15 or 20 species of wildflowers growing. There was just a super abundance just, just a month ago out here when things were a little bit fresher. You just think every time you go around the corner, you're walking up a wash, you wonder what's gonna be around the next corner. Might there be a Gila monster walking along? 
or a tortoise or some kind of a snake or you just never know what you're going to find and so it makes it really fun to be out here when it's, when it's reasonable to walk around in the spring. These desert adapted plants and animals may hold some keys to human survival in a rapidly warming world. The unique genetic makeup of desert plants and animals is a sort of resource for the future, potentially crucial for developing new crops, livestock, and medicines as our climate warms. In the Mojave, over the next 50 to 100 years, temperatures are expected to rise between 5 and 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Rainfall is expected to decrease. Will temperatures in some places be greater than tortoises or their eggs can tolerate? What will happen to the plants making up their diet? How will tortoise habitat change? Science is the starting point for addressing these questions. There is already a foundation of scientific knowledge to build on. Tools such as the habitat model can help forecast some effects of climate change while guiding management of habitat and species. Mounting threats to the tortoise now include invasive plants, disease, wildfires, roads, ravens, coyotes, off-road vehicles, other predators, and now climate change. The question remains, can the tortoise population stabilize and thrive? People know about the tortoise, they care about the tortoise, and I think that one thing uh, may be the, the biggest thing that, that helps turn it around. And so we've got to have people on our team and people that want to help and, and people that care. And I think that's coming around and that's a big positive thing. But in fact, we're, we're dealing with 60 million years of evolution here. Desert tortoises have been around a very, very long time. And people revere them for that reason. Uh, the public, the general public, wants to know that we've got tortoises on a landscape that are not just been put there for their viewing, but that are existing out there in a natural habitat uh, on their own. Humans collectively have had a big negative impact on desert tortoise habitat, but people individually can make a big positive difference too. If you see a tortoise in the wild, look at it, take its picture, see what it's doing. Uh, basically, it's something to appreciate, but not to mess with. But it is good to take a good look, so you really can understand the essence of tortoise, half of which is pulling its head in its shell and staying like that for an hour. <laughs> Before dawn, the scientist's work begins. Science is critical to desert tortoise recovery because there's a lot of uncertainties in how all the numerous threats that face the tortoise interact and, and affect tortoise populations. Without science, we wouldn't be able to sort any of that out and anything that we did on the ground would just be a crapshoot. Oh. I find the tortoise to be very fascinating because it seems like such a, a meek species, but has been able to survive all these years out in the desert. And, and I think more and more, as, as we're facing uh, bigger and bigger threats, uh, we need to use whatever science we can to understand how these animals are actually responding. The tortoise tells us so much about the health of the desert. It's a very long-lived animal. It's a sentinel of the well-being of our environment. And for that reason alone, I think we should be very concerned about its well-being and that it thrives. Building on our knowledge of the tortoise, its habitat and threats to its existence remains a key to Mojave Desert Tortoise survival into the future.